How you doing? Jamie Lewis here. I'm going to share with you right now how I made a whole bunch of money online. And if I die tomorrow from smoking, you'll have the full story. I sure hope you enjoy this audio and get something out of it because this is happening right now. I basically built Beats365.com and SonicProducer.com, which collectively grossed a few million dollars. And then I launched many other sites, some I'm ultra proud of and others I wish I'd never created. I'm not writing all this to toot my own horn or brag, and you'll see why I have no need to do this for that reason. I'm trying to help you with some awesome online business strategies without you having to pay some scammer 35 grand to coach you. See, a lot of those other business people and gurus, they never open their mouth like this because then their coaching would be obsolete, or whatever you call it. And therefore, you really never get this side of the story or the truth to how to really make a substantial, significant business online. I truly believe, and I think you do too, that the reason no one explains it for free is because their bio is not very impressive and wouldn't help anyone sell anything. But on the other hand, no one else is going to do it for you. So posting an auto blog on a Facebook page and then sitting there waiting, it'll not ever do anything for you. Self-responsibility is the most important thing. This is a story of someone who is mega proud of a lot of hard work, and I hope it inspires other people to create something really cool on the internet. I know a lot of people have been asking me to share my story in this way for years, which I haven't really made public to the extent that you will see on this page for the first time. I feel personally that this is super duper important to tell you a little something, as of course the way I did it was pretty cool, and some of the tactics to get paid, they were super easy. Heck, you'll probably dig it and you'll want to try some of these philosophies and techniques with your business. To create a website and have it blow up into a million dollar business, you need to really love doing it. It's the same thing as showbiz. If you love doing it, then you could get big quick. It doesn't matter if you're a young kid or someone with an MBA. Whatever you love doing, you can monetize it, and that's what this page is all about. By the looks of all those How Jamie Got Rich marketing posts and all of the internet marketing crap all over the internet associated with my name, you'd never know that more than two million in gross sales came from my musical endeavors. And if you were to further break down the figure, you'd see that the content devices and business models are exactly the same as the ones I used before the internet came along. As you probably already know, business is about the three Ps, product, placement, and price. Without the internet, how does an artist distribute? How do you produce payments? Ever heard the term starving artist? Well, that term shouldn't exist anymore. See, I always had products and services. I created and taught music all my life, but could not make much money doing it because I had no distribution, no affiliates, no payment processing or storefront. So when I got my first internet connection, I was able to finally solve those challenges. And soon after I began to make an amazing amount of money selling my music that I produced, video instruction of myself producing music, teaching drum lessons, guitar lessons, photography, domain names, and information, with the only difference being it was all digitized and selling on autopilot using the internet as a medium. Now look, here's how it's done. When someone asks me how to get rich online, I tell them to produce themselves. Different people do different things, so do what you're familiar with, whether you're an affiliate marketer and sell products online for commission, or you write your own book and it sells on Kindle, it helps to spend time in niches that you're an expert in and never try to fake it. However, if you stumble across a traffic opportunity or some type of competitive advantage, you may want to jump on it, even if you're unfamiliar with the content. You'll need to spend some time in that case getting familiar with the new endeavor you're embarking on. I know what you might be thinking. I don't have any specialties. I'm not an artist. I have no content. Then you're an opportunistic marketer, which is fine if done ethically. That's just what I call it. The vendor and affiliate model are polar opposites that require different protocols. I ended up having success as a vendor first because I was able to transform what I was already doing into being a vendor and selling my own products. I learned all about how to successfully run the affiliate model from doing this second. So if you're looking to learn more about marketing, I think this post might be a real eye-opener to those who keep buying the products and get chronic information overload. It's really quite simple. Make a splash. And then there's, of course, the, you know what, Jamie, you're a this and that and all of the bad words. Look, I love the hate. It gives me more fuel to do much more. And to my fans, heck, I appreciate the love. So first off, let's get the how to make money online question out of the way. Look, I use the internet to advertise my websites and affiliate promotions. Make sense? So let me break down how I, it got started. Before I begin the marathon timeline of timelines, let me quickly disclose something really important. 
I'll try my best to include all the little details. I'll try my darned hardest to throw you some gems. And throughout the years, there was all sorts of absurdly easy stuff I used to do to make money before I got all fat and lazy. Well, I didn't really get fat though, but I'm, I might not be able to remember the exact URLs and stuff. There was just so much stuff I tried and did. In fact, so much that after doing 400 hours of instructional webinars, I'm still talking about it. I recommend you do your own research and use my parameters. However, with that being said, I think you'll see I'm trying pretty hard to explain all the little details and settings regarding the AdWords accounts and all of that, all right? So look, oh, and one last thing. I'm rounding out numbers a lot in this article from memory. For instance, if something I did made me $367.35, I might mention $350 or $400 from memory or average. For instance, my 10 million in gross sales, although based on actual figures, represents total gross earnings my entire time online since 2004, and it's rounded out and estimated since the year has not ended yet. Let's talk about the timeline. This was my very first e-commerce website here, bestbeatsonline.com, a place to buy original hip-hop beats made by Jamie Lewis or my stage name, Nebula. First off, it was a big flop in my opinion, but it was a necessary step I had to take in killing the Beats market. I had to see how much people did not want to spend $5 to $50 a beat. I hear that. I wouldn't want to spend $50 a beat either. People don't want to license Beats when they can just download the free available ones off SoundClick. So as you will see, I needed to go back to the drawing board and recalibrate, which once accomplished would serve as a foundation for a lot of very successful internet projects. This is how it started. The year was 2004, and I had just recently been fired from Elias Arts New York City, which was basically the snobbiest music house in the world, where they created music for commercials. I had been working there a month when then that gave me the boot. I guess because I was showing a lot of contempt having to work in the dub room. See, I was a composer who was already working freelance in New York City and winning bids for major commercials, being able to write, perform, and produce music in an extraordinarily short amount of time, usually anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours. That's what I'm good at, and one of the only things that I was good at, besides other related skills like Photoshop, to create album covers and Final Cut Pro to produce music videos. My entire family consists of classical musicians with record deals and perform concerts all over the world, including venues like Carnegie Hall and others, so naturally I sucked at sports as a kid, but was a natural at the arts. I grew edgy and hostile since I didn't really like work doing the dirty work for other shittier composers in that dub room. And I had this subliminal resentment, so although these people at Elias were incredibly arrogant, elitist, and abusive, I take responsibility that I had failed their hazing period, for lack of a better word. Before I was at, hired at Elias, I worked at Sam Ash, New York City in Times Square in 2003. Now that job was a job, but I met a ton of producers like Riza, Irv Gotti, and DJ Clue that I had admired a lot. One day the phone rang in the store and I'd picked it up as usual. On the other end was a dude who was asking me if I, we had a certain keyboard in stock. I told him, sure, come on down. See, we always had the thing in stock and I felt I didn't need to look at inventory. I asked his name on the phone and he said, I'm Jim. And I told him to ask for Jamie when he got there. Well, everything went to shit when Jimmy Fallon walked in and I quickly found out this was Jim and I didn't have it in stock. We got in an argument and to this day when I see Jimmy on the TV, I remember that retarded day. I had created a reel consisting of my Claymation short film where Clay figures stormed the record label offices and killed executives. I mailed a few dozen copies to all the music houses and I, I heard back from a few of them as they were really impressed. One of the music houses asked me to come in for an interview. It was a smaller music house named Ant Music, run by this guy, Anthony. I traveled into the city from my apartment in Queens on the N train, and I picked up a fruit salad on the way. I did the interview eating fruit salad. They told me that they loved the reel, and they wanted me to produce some freelance style for them. So Anthony called me a month later and asked me to produce a Wendy's commercial. You basically were paid $300 for the demo, and then your piece of music is put in a pool to be chosen by advertising agencies. So the producer, Chuck, told me to combine a rocky feel with a techno-pop sound because the video was a big girl on a treadmill that falls off. I never did see the video, but I never won the job either. So I only made $300. But they really liked what I did, so Anthony told me I'd be working for them a lot more. Their producer, Chuck, was a great guy and was going to be in touch with me that week. The gigs kept coming, and realistically, I was making $300 a week from this in addition to my $200 a week from Sam Ash, 
until I did a Pantene commercial and I actually won. They wrote me a fat check for $2,000 and I had never seen that much money in my entire life. I was hooked. I was soaking wet from pouring rain during my final interview at Elias where I knocked it out of the park, so then about a month later I got the call one day while working at Sam Ash. All my friends at Sam Ash were hating when I got the call from Elias that day. It was right before Christmas time since I guess they wanted to start the year off with a new dub room guy and they offered me $35,000 a year. When Elias hired me, I, I think it made Anthony a little jealous or something, but I told him we would stay in touch. I began working at Elias and the atmosphere was very strange and manipulative. I'd be given contradicting tasks all the time as a prank and it pissed me off that the other composers sucked really bad. Heck, Ant Music loved me, so why was I in a dub room? But I fell for the elitism and I respected their brand for some reason, even though their music sounded like bad porno music. So towards the end of my month at Elias, a big job for a MasterCard priceless spot came in and I left early the night before the ad agency was going to be listening to our finished work without finishing the dub, right? I left early. The next morning I came in and they needed the dub. I told them it wasn't done yet. They had a flippin' cow and brought me into one of the studios, the creative director holding a piece of paper in his hand. This piece of paper simply stated they were terminating me and it, they basically wanted me to sign on the dotted line. This was the world I had been living in. I was so hardworking, and I was obsessed, disciplined, and companies like Ant Music, who actually gave me a chance to be myself, knew this. Immediately after being fired, I literally walked across the street to Ant Music and busted in on them, telling them how upset I was. They laughed when I told them I messed up the MasterCard spot and told me that Elias was pissed because one of Ant Music's composers landed the spot. They had submitted their reel faster, and they were awarded the job because I messed up. Well, this was at least how Elias made it sound. I could have probably gotten in huge trouble if they knew I worked for Ant Music at the same time. But I knew that Ant Music wasn't the only outlet that would allow me to be myself and do what I'm good at. The way these companies worked wasn't the best man for the job, it was like wait in line, risk getting fired if you don't get along with someone at the company. And even after years of working for them, you're writing music and never getting credit for it. I was devastated when, I, when they fired me because I'd been waiting in line for over a year for the job, and if I couldn't work my dream job, what was I to do? So look, I built the BBO website after asking my friend Donald Heller for help learning HTML and everything. I had driven up to Connecticut where he lives, studied with him for two hours, and took notes. I got home and I tried building a website and created my first page that night. I was ready to take over the world. Something that amazed me was that every page on the site is basically like the one page you designed, right? But just duplicated, i.e. your template. And then your links just, they all link all together. And you know what? See, I told you it was, uh, was street, easy to learn from, right? I told my father that I wanted to incorporate and have him as my vice president of my new company. I incorporated online and then we decided to hire a lawyer to look everything over. So my father went online looking for an attorney in the New York area and the first result that came up was Chris Hoyt, New York City. Chris's ho office was on the top of the Empire State Building, so we drove into Manhattan together in my father's car and we met with him. We knew we were going to be selling tons of music online as I had around 500 pieces of music produced in the past three years. Chris did a company name change for us and we ate in the restaurant below to celebrate, as my dad called it. And little did I know Chris would become a good friend of mine and the attorney that I always go to first before my other three attorneys. You want to know something really funny? All of my attorney's first names start with the letter C for some reason. Chris, Claude, Clark, and Carl. I swear. So there we were, trying to start an entertainment business again. My dad is a very left-leaning socialist, but he's a pretty much a genius. He is a professor at a university just like my mother too, and I wouldn't call him an entrepreneur, rather a leader of groups. Around a year later, me and my father got into a big fight over something, and we decided for me to continue with the company myself only. So anyhow, after learning how to create a website, I created the template, the graphics, and hired someone off script lance to do the little preview buttons that allowed people to sample my music. I then went searching for a payment processor, and that's when I found MediaPal. They put themselves out as a solution to process payments and track downloads, which I had been wondering how to do for a long time. To tell you the truth, once the site was up, I can't remember if I advertised at all. I thought the traffic will just find your site, and to be honest, I hadn't read Google Cache yet, which was basically my lesson in advertising, which would later spark a huge fire and what I refer to as the Great Beat Monopoly of 2005. First off, I sold one $300 beat exclusively, a couple $50 non-exclusives, 
and I thought that was cool, but obviously not a lot to live on. Around the same time, since I was unemployed, I did a search for work-at-home opportunities, and of course I joined a bunch of bullshit programs like the paid surveys online. I wasted a few days signing up at 200 survey opportunities, which the survey program's instructions had told me to do, and I began to vigilantly check my inbox. Tons of spammy-looking survey opportunities flooded my inbox, and I would begin filling them out. Every time I did something, I was illegible or something, so I gave up at surveys. The next program I bought was Google Cash, written by a dude named Chris Carpenter. And this one was interesting. It talked all about using AdWords to promote ClickBank and Commission Junction offers. I'll tell you, I didn't even know what an ebook was before reading the Google Cash ebook. Aside from learning all about affiliate marketing and Google AdWords advertising from this ebook, I learned to make your own ebook was simple. You write a book with Microsoft Word and print it as a PDF file. But really, all I needed to know and all I had to read was how you could get paid commissions for selling other people's stuff and I was hooked. ClickBank. The processor that I'd found a few days earlier that seemed so simple for what I wanted to do would end up making me millions. I then also signed up for eTrade to trade stocks, a Forex.com account to trade currency, and an eBay account as well. I was basically taking stuff into my own hands. I didn't know what, I was, what was going to work and in hindsight, none of it worked. I was the one who worked. And, and now when I look back, I made a ton of money actually using eBay and some, some money with E-Trade too, but that fell apart quick, if you know what I mean, especially after 2008. But seriously, I stopped buying products and eBooks in 2005 after we wasting a week on the surveys only to get spammed out the butt. Even though in the beginning I did suffer from the eBook will make you the money syndrome, but I stopped thinking that other people could do things for me, at least I knew this, but I didn't want to believe it. I was pretty stubborn with that and continued to learn the lesson over and over and over again that I am the only one that can really make things happen. Nevertheless, I came up with an idea to put a new Beats website on ClickBank, but this one would have to be much different as they didn't have a shopping cart. Now MediaPal had a shopping cart, but a month went by and my $450 in earnings was sitting in MediaPal and they never paid me. I learned the hard way that networks rip you off. I didn't even know about PayPal yet, and my initial inquiries online looking for processors scared me since I misunderstood that a lot of big-name payment platforms like CC Bill charge $800 for adult content because of Visa and MasterCard regulations, or something like that. I didn't have any adult content, but thought this applied to me. So when I joined ClickBank, the decision was really made because it only cost $50 for a vendor account, and this seemed like a deal. That's a retarded reason to have gotten signed up to ClickBank, right? So since ClickBank didn't have a shopping cart and I didn't know how to code, it was almost like I was in some way forced to sell all of my beats as a package that would later make me a million dollars. Now I built the new website in a couple of days and I priced it at $15 for 300 or so beats. My front page or index contained around 30 previews of my best beats. If you liked what you heard, there was information at the bottom of the page regarding how much I was selling the package for and the process of purchasing, basically the call to action. The buy it now button would sell product number two in my ClickBank account, which gave paying customers the members area, where they could download all of the instrumentals. The instrumentals were in MP3 format and the user could download all 300 beats in about 10 minutes with a high speed connection. It was around October 2004 and now I had read about Google AdWords for advertising. I'd tried it promoting ClickBank offers. I'd gotten my first sale, broken even on advertising fees, nothing glamorous, but that was not the only endeavor on my mind. I wanted to crack the vendor code. So Beats 365 was born. Now with the few hits of Google AdWords, I started to get sales very easily. Of course, everyone wanted a whole bunch of Beats for $15. I now had an autopilot business online. Remember, prior to creating the package, even with traffic, I think I only sold two or three single beats. So if someone bought my package, I'd get around $12.50 after ClickBank fees. So with my PPC campaign selling three packages for every 100 visitors at five cents a click, it cost $5 to make $12 times three. I could get 200 clicks a day, so I was very excited. This was a one-page site that was making me $60 a day out of nowhere. The niche was very uncompetitive. Sure, there were networks like SoundClick where you, there were people selling beats, but most of the actual sites that sold beats did not use AdWords and did not know about affiliate programs or my new model. So the result was that no one was bidding on my terms. 
My terms were rap beats, rap instrumentals, hip hop beats, and hip hop instrumentals. It felt like it was too good to be true. There were competitors that had all their ducks in a row and were run by famous producers, but I guess they hadn't read ebooks on marketing or sometimes, you know, as they were entirely confident only in their production abilities, which doesn't really get you far in a competitive environment. One day I looked into the account and I saw a few transactions for product two, but the amount I made was $5.71 and I was pissed. I looked a little closer and I saw that these sales were made by ClickBank affiliates and that they'd found my site on the marketplace and chose to promote my product. Every day now there were four or five $5, $71 sales and I felt like I was being ripped off. My account was set to 50% commissions and so I dropped the commission to 20%. The $5.71 sales ceased after a couple of days. After a week or so, my weekly earnings had had a dip since I killed my affiliates. I wasn't making as much. I looked a little closer at the marketplace and other offers, and in doing so, I came across my site in the marketplace. It said I had five gravity. Gravity represented the number of affiliates I had. Other sites on the marketplace had 350 gravity, and I had five. So I figured affiliates might be a good thing. I thought to myself, maybe I'll gain more affiliates. I also noticed that all the other sites in the marketplace had 50% or more, with most of the sites all the way up to 75% commission. So I put my affiliate commission at 70%, since I had nothing to lose. I was the only Beats 365 affiliate at this point. So I started getting sales from affiliates again. I learned that it's better to be generous, and the word spreads fast and the rewards outweigh the results if you have an insular philosophy. So I kept making beats that were really good until I had around a thousand of them. I then had so many different genres, I revamped the entire site that you could preview some of the best beats I had by genre. Later on, I raised the price to $34.95 and rode with that for a few years until dropping the price to $29.95. As I will explain in the next few, few paragraphs, I started promoting a database offer for autos that had a teaser search for makes and models, and I adopted this idea and I implemented it with my beat site. As soon as I did that, my $60 a day turned into $100 to $300 a day with Beats 365. Yes, that is the way that ClickBank bars looked back then. Now, I don't know if you do Beats, but this proved to be an insane model. A couple other people started doing the same and created similar type offers on ClickBank for their music. The funny thing was that they all pretended like they didn't outright jack my templates, formatting, and even the language I used. I didn't mind as long as they were good to work with on the marketplace and didn't talk shit about my stuff. Although, yes, of course, I've seen a lot of dirty-ass wannabes go anonymous and try that stuff. Man, the things I could tell you. All right, here's one. One cat on SoundClick thought it would be pretty funny to do a whole diss theme with one of my tracks. He took one of my beats and rapped over it, dissing Beats 365, and put it on his SoundClick. He had like 100,000 plays or something total on his SoundClick, which was pretty decent. So here he is, takes one of my tracks and then raps lyrics over it like, Don't go to Beats 365, buy my stuff, Beats 365 is BS. Which would have been fair game, except, you know what, he was using my copyrighted beats and making things worse, being a bad competitor. So I emailed SoundClick and I told them, yo, you got this dude doing this and that. They kicked him off right away. So immediately they, after they banned his account, I registered to SoundClick, and when you do, SoundClick asks you what username you want. So I chose this guy's username. Now this kid had been promoting the heck out of his SoundClick address, I can't remember the exact URL, but let's say it was Big Beats. So now I owned the Big Beats SoundClick account, and he didn't. So I posted a picture of a big hairy you-know-what and gay pride theme along with some really, really bad beats on the poor kid's SoundClick page. All these kids and friends of his were LOLing and leaving comments like WTF? Well, let's say the guy wasn't very happy when he got home from school. In fact, he was crying to me, messaging me over and over again via AIM. Yep, he knew it was the same dude who pleaded with him the day before not to use his stuff that way. Although he was a certified walking you-know-what, I felt very bad, so I gave it back to the kid. I've always been like that. I, st I stick it in, but I pull out when you squirm. I don't like to see people in pain. The kid told me he would never mess with me again. I was also using SoundClick to market test my beats. It was a great tool. I would upload a beat, and if it hit the top 50, I'd use that one as a preview. A couple even reached the top 10 on SoundClick, and those beats I used on the front page on Autoplay. In doing this, my conversion rate soared, and I saw more and more sales come in from the same affiliate. Affiliates were emailing me constantly, asking me to add their conversion tracking to my thank you page. 
The reason they asked me to do this was so that they get a measurement in their accounts which, that explains which keywords were working for them and which ones weren't and needed to be paused or deleted. After a couple months, my thank you page code had 30 or so conversion tracking codes in the source code. I started promoting Beats 365 from my SoundClick and one of my Beats, Club Banga 364, hit number 8 on the SoundClick charts. I'd woken up to my aim going every 5 seconds with someone telling me my Beats are dope, etc. This dude named Gravity, he's a rapper who rocked the charts at SoundClick over and over again. He was messaging me on my aim and I was happy to be speaking with him since he rocks. I told him, you know what? Look what I'm doing with Beats 365. And I asked him if he wanted to be an affiliate. And right away, he was down. I signed him up to ClickBank and I put a banner up on his sound clip. Gravity started making three to four sales a day from the site. My Beats website was now kicking butt and I was making $1,500 to $2,000 a week. The refund rate was less than 5%, so the ClickBank paychecks were amazing. The best thing about it was ClickBank actually sent me the checks, unlike MediaPal. So by an, uh, now a year later, in 2005, my friend Jesse Brooks, who I'd known since 1997, when he answered my ad in the Village Voice for metal guitarists, he came out to see me where I lived in Astoria, Queens. We were chilling out and he asked if he could use my computer to post for jobs. He went to a popular website that I had not yet known about and started to post stuff. A light bulb went off in my head. I needed to start promoting ClickBank offers using this website. And so the next day I started and it worked. Sure enough, I was able to get sales from it and get them for free. Every morning I'd check my email and help out my customers to see if they needed help downloading all of my tracks. Then after that, I'd go to the website Jesse showed me and post in 12 major cities promoting the database offer. I would consistently make a couple hundred dollars a day. Now this didn't work forever because a competitor was knocking my ads down. And I told my friend Tyler about it who started doing it too, making it even harder for me, inevitably wrecking our friendship. But one thing it did for me was show me that the affiliate thing was real and the time I spent looking for traffic is time well spent. I also created my own database offer like the one I was promoting, which was basically like a digital yellow pages for auctions in 50 states. Back in 2005, they were very popular. I started getting affiliates for this as well and then one morning I woke up to $300 already in my ClickBank account. There all of a sudden was a, one affiliate, he was doing all the selling. The next day, the guy contacts me on AIM and introduced himself and I told him that, you know what, I was really happy with the way my website performed and he was happy as well and therefore we were going to continue promoting it both every day. So sure enough, even a month later, he was still promoting it for me. This is when I, I took that same website model and I redid Beats 365 the same way with many different pages for each genre. The site took off like a rocket. All of my friends were in disbelief and I was hooked. There was no way I was ever going to work for someone ever again. Even if my site failed and didn't work anymore for, for some reason, I would find a way the same way I had done so far. At this point, I was getting all sorts of ideas to sell my intellectual property, 